Well, hello, everybody. It is good to see you. As always, I want to welcome our campuses. And besides welcoming our Kenosha campus, Racine campus, online campus, I want to welcome our Weekends on Wednesday service. Wow. All right, guys, we are two weeks away from happy hour starting, which means in two weeks, the very first Wednesday of June, uh, we are going to uh, begin offering free meals at 6 o'clock. Our services start at 7, so we'll have uh, Great Lakes Kids going on as well, but we are going to have a happy hour, and uh, we say free food if you consider hot dogs food. It's like tailgate, and we're going to have a good time, all right? So here's the deal, guys. Three weeks ago, we started this brand new series called... Ripple effect. And uh, we're talking about the impact of a single life. Now, when I mention the name Joshua Green, my guess is not a single person has ever heard of this guy. And I don't expect you to. All right, Joshua Green was a Seattle businessman who made a fortune as the owner of a fleet of ships. All right, so there were passenger ships and freight ships. And, and so he made a lot of money in this and it actually became a huge catalyst for the Washington State ferry system. So if you've ever taken a a ferry boat in the state of Washington, specifically Seattle area, it was Joshua Green's company that had a huge part and a huge role in making that happen. Well, he ends up selling that, he takes money, and he invests it in the banking system, made a lot of money there. And so somewhere towards the end of his life, Mr. Green, uh, like so many wealthy people, takes the time to set up a trust fund for his descendants and to set up a uh, foundation for nonprofits and other organizations that do really effective and important work. Now, the reason I tell you that story is I am actually friends with Joshua Green's granddaughter and her family, all right? So Jerome and Leslie and their family uh, have been close friends of mine for several years. They still live in the Seattle area. And, And I tell you that because Jerome and Leslie are two of the most generous people I have ever met in my life. In the early years of our church, they were huge financial supporters in fueling our mission and getting us off the ground. Uh, Sometime in the last year when our church had a special need, I actually uh, flew out to Seattle, met with them, and uh, even before I had flown out there, they said, hey, we're going to get behind this and we're going to help support this, Uh, which means that Joshua Green's decision to be responsible with the resources he had and to use them in a very wise way and to set up these trust funds and to set up foundation actually is having a ripple effect in all of our lives even though we don't realize it. The fact that our church exists is because of people like Joshua Green and then the very generous uh, family that, that he has and in and, and, and this last year they, they connected me with his foundation and it was Literally, a guy's decision to be responsible with money that is impacting us today, even though we don't even realize it. The big idea of this series is that the life of just one person can have far-reaching effects. So each week of the series, I've been telling you that my parents' decision to follow Jesus obviously played a huge role in my life growing up. I decided to follow Jesus. I saw the fruit in their life, love and joy and peace. I saw that they were sincere about following God. And so then my decision to follow Jesus uh, obviously played a huge role in starting a church back in 2008. And then consequently, you at some level, just the fact you're here today and being impacted means that the decision of my parents to follow Jesus is having ripple effects even now today. Your life is going to have a ripple effect for the good or for the bad, whether you realize it or not. And so this series has been about how can following Jesus have a ripple effect, have an impact on not just the lives of people around us, but on the lives of people potentially that we will never, ever meet. And so each week of this series, what we've done is we've looked at one or two key verses in the book of Colossians. And the reason we're looking at Colossians is it's actually a letter written in the first century to individuals living in the city of Colossae, which is part of modern-day Turkey. More specifically, this letter was written to brand new followers of Jesus, people who had just opened their hearts and received God's grace into their life. And so the purpose of Paul's letter was to say, I'm cheering you on. 
I'm excited. You've received God's grace in your life. I'm proud of you. Way to go. But just know, there is a difference between the grace of God, the forgiveness of sins, the, the power and the strength we need day by day by day, certainly, but there is a difference between the grace of God and the way of God. What it looks like following him on a regular basis for a very long time. And the reason this is important for us to grasp is because we, we all ought to know this by now. That there are a lot of people who start their spiritual journey well, but they do not finish well. They get sidetracked along the way. And it's not because they're bad people, and it's not because they're evil or mean-spirited. It's because new faith is fragile faith. It's vulnerable faith. So in this letter, the apostle Paul writes to these new believers and he says, hey, I've got some thoughts on how you can grow and I've got some instruction on what it's gonna take to mature. And if you've missed any of the previous weeks, you can go online to greatlakeschurch.com and you can catch up. Now today I'm super excited because we are in chapter four. It's actually a, a, a letter that's only four chapters long. And what we're gonna look at today is something that Paul writes that's very specific about the ongoing impact that our life can have and how to create ripple effects in our world. Here's what he writes. He says, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Life is a journey. And everyone is at a different place in their journey, especially when it comes to faith, right? Everybody's got their own set of questions, their own insecurities that they're wrestling with because faith by its very nature is believing something without the benefit of tangible evidence. And so the apostle Paul writes to these new believers and he says, live wisely among those who do not share the same faith you do. And what he's communicating in this letter is something we have said many, many, many times here at Great Lakes Church, and I'm going to say it again. Don't try to make a point. Try to make a difference. Don't spend your life trying to make a point. Spend your life trying to make a difference. Making a point is easy. All right, if I wanted to make a point, I could just get up here and tell you really dramatic stories. I could give you a bunch of statistics. I could read articles to you and, and get all worked up. I can wave my arms around everywhere and I usually do that anyways, right? Or I can say something very dramatically and then just get real quiet and let you think about it, right? And, and, and actually, it's pretty fun making a point. There's nothing wrong with it. I actually kind of enjoy doing it. And it's really fun making a point with people who already agree with us. Because I could get up here and I could say some things and you'd be like, yeah, that's so good, Dave. Say that again, right? If you've got a Baptist background, you might even go, amen. And you get me worked up or you might clap a little bit and say, we agree with that. So all of that is fun. But making a point is easy. This past week, you might have seen uh, Steph Curry, the all-star basketball player on the Golden State Warriors. And he is a devoted follower of Jesus. But he got all fired up after making uh, a shot that he looks at the crowd and he takes out his mouth guard and he says with all intense uh, tensity in his body that he could muster up, this is my freaking house. But of course he didn't say freaking, he used explicit, you know, expl expletive. And, and it was so out of character for him. This is my freaking house. That afterwards he was hounded by reporters. You know, people wanted to know what in the world was going through you. This isn't like you. And here what he said. He said, my mom has already sent me two home videos showing me the clip and playing it back. All right, he's 30 years old and mama's still going to make a point. Like, you cross the line. He goes on to say this. She was telling me how I need to wash my mouth out, saying to wash it out with soap. It's a message I've heard before. And it won't shock you that my mom has mentioned things to me after talks that I've given along the similar, you know, vein. 30 years old, but mama's still going to make a point. Here's what she knows. She can't force him to do anything different, but she's going to still take her right as mama to say what she wants to say. It's easy to make a point, but it is very, very, very difficult to make a difference. And the reason for that is making a difference takes a lot of time. Making a difference is a very slow process. Now, we're reminded of this when we look at some of the earliest followers of Jesus. 
The earliest followers of Jesus didn't really have the ability to make a point. They didn't have a platform. They didn't have lots of money. They certainly didn't have lots of influence or power. They didn't have fancy buildings like we have to gather everybody. They weren't really organized. They didn't have a bunch of technology and being able to communicate whatever they wanted to communicate. And so basically they did what they were able to do and that was love and serve and care for people in their community. And because they loved and cared and served the people in their community, within 300 years of Jesus, the Roman Empire went from being totally anti-Jesus, oppressing, torturing the followers of Jesus, to actually being a catalyst for the Jesus movement. And it happened, not again because a bunch of people went around making a point. These were people who couldn't make a point. They didn't have that kind of power. They didn't have that kind of education. They didn't have that kind of voice. What they did is they focused on making a difference. This is why the Apostle Paul, in his letter to these new believers, writes, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Now, if I really want for my life to have an impact... If I want for my faith to have a ripple effect in the lives of not just people I know, but potentially in the lives of people I don't know, there are a few things that I need to embrace. There are a few things I need to learn to do or not do. All right? Number one is this. I need to learn how to build relational bridges with those I disagree with. I need to spend time with people I disagree with. I need to value people I disagree with. I need to respect people I disagree with. I need to learn how to listen and learn from people I disagree with. And the reason the Apostle Paul is so passionate about this, because he actually spends several verses talking about it, is because he knows it's the only way we're ever going to have a true impact with our life. And we see this evidence in his own life. Around 49 AD, the Apostle Paul visits the city of Athens. Okay, so Athens, Greece, he goes and he visits, and it is a city that's filled with temples dedicated to gods and goddesses. Uh, it's a city that worships anything and everything. They've got altars all around the city in, in which they would set them up to, to worship these Greek gods and Roman gods. Well, Paul is a very educated Jewish man. Ever since he was a child, he had been taught the Hebrew scriptures, and one of the most predominant Hebrew scriptures in one of the most predominant Jewish laws was do not worship other gods and do not have idols that reflect other gods. And yet in this city, there were idols everywhere. I mean, Paul is surrounded by them. And it didn't sit well with him. In fact, we, we read this. While Paul was in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. So everywhere he looks, these gods and these goddesses, these altars to Romans and Greek, Roman and Greek gods. It would have been so easy for the Apostle Paul to just say, all right, everybody, you're going to hell. It would have been so easy for him to say, you don't understand the damage you're doing with all of these idols. But Paul wasn't concerned with making a point. What Paul wanted to do was spend his life making a difference. And so he actually did a pretty brilliant thing. As he's walking around the city, he actually comes to an altar with an inscription. It says, to the unknown God. The Athenians were pretty funny people. They had so many altars and so many different gods and goddesses they served. They were concerned that if a god or goddess showed up that they were prepared for, like they would be in trouble. And so they had this altar and they would be able to say, hey, we, 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 we thought of you. We just didn't know what your name was. So to the altar, uh, to the unknown God. Now, Paul could have stood up on that altar and said, ladies and gentlemen, hear me. But here's what he did. He, he said, hey, ladies and gentlemen, gather around. He said, I'm looking around your city. I see this altar. It's obvious to me you're really religious people. I'm religious just like you are. So he finds this common ground. He doesn't berate them. He doesn't go into some sort of sermon to try to really, you know, fire them up. He, he just says, hey, I, I'm religious just like you. He says, but you have this altar, it says, to the unknown God. He said, let me talk to you about the God that you don't know. And so he launches into this talk about Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. And at the end of his talk, most of the people thought he was a little crazy. So they laughed at him and said, we, we don't, you know, believe anything you're saying. 
There were a handful of people, though, that said, hey, we want to come back another time and hear you talk some more. This is kind of intriguing. And then there were even some other people that said, we actually believe what you have to say. And what I want us to hear is this, that Paul, in an opportunity to position himself against everyone, didn't do that. That wasn't who he was. And the same thing with Jesus. Jesus didn't position himself against people. And the reason this is so important for us to understand is because all throughout our life, there are going to be well-meaning followers of Jesus who think that we should spend our life buying billboards and printing t-shirts and doing marketing campaigns and picketing and boycotting organizations that may not support the values that we hold so dear. That they may not get behind the same kind of beliefs that we feel are core and central to following Jesus. And it's important that we resist this pressure that other followers of Jesus will want to put on us. Pressure to put up walls that separate us from other people rather than build bridges in our relationships. When, when, when Paul says, hey, live wisely among people who don't believe the same way you do, there's this assumption that we actually have friendships and relationships with people who believe differently than us and maybe hold a different set of values. And historically, the reason this is so difficult for followers of Jesus is because we, we tend to get a little afraid of being associated with people who think differently or maybe behave differently, right? Guilt by association, there's this kind of this fear. And, and I just want you to know, Jesus didn't have that fear. The apostle Paul didn't have that fear. And in fact, Matthew, who was one of the disciples of Jesus, he talks about the reputation Jesus had. He actually writes about it. Here's the reputation Jesus had. Here's what people said about him. He's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and other sinners. Jesus couldn't have cared less of what people thought about him in regards to who he hung out with. Same with the Apostle Paul, which is why five to ten years after he visits the city of Athens and he has this great conversation, he writes to these new believers and he says, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Now, a second way that I can make the most of every opportunity and try to make a difference with my life is I need to learn how to avoid debates that distract from the primary issues. You do not have to attend every argument that you are invited into. This is huge. People, often the ultra-religious people in our society, want to debate things. This was the same with Jesus. The ultra-religious in his day were constantly trying to suck him into some sort of debate. In fact, the Pharisees, who were the religious elite in Jewish culture, they were constantly asking Jesus questions, trying to trap him with the answers that he gave. So one day, Jesus is walking around, and a Pharisee stops him and says, Excuse me, Jesus, i got a question for you. Should we pay taxes to the Roman government? Like the government that will step in and try to oppress us, the government that's taken away some of our power. Should, should we pay taxes to those, those people? And Jesus knew they were trying to trick him with this question and trap him with, with how he answered. And so he says, hey, does anybody have a coin? Somebody fished around, they gave him a coin, and he asked this question, whose image is on this coin? Who is it? And then somebody responded, hey, that's Caesar the ruler of the Roman Empire, that's his image. And Jesus says, okay, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give to God what belongs to God. Done, out, see ya. He just walks away. And they're like, what just happened? Right? And this was a regular occurrence. Often, the, the most common way that Jesus would respond to people who asked him questions to kind of trap him is he would respond with his own question back to them. I love it in one story. He asked a question back to them and they said, we don't know the answer. He said, okay, then I'm not going to give you an answer either. Bye. This was like, Done. Sometimes, there are questions you should never answer based on who's asking them, why they're asking them, where they're asking them, and the context for why they're asking them. If you really want to make a difference, guard yourself. Do not be dragged into issues that are not central to who Jesus is. And if you've attended Great Lakes Church for a while, you know this is core to who I am. I can point, in fact, more people have left this church over an issue of me not making a statement on something specific than any other thing. 
Not making a, a, a statement on divorce and remarriage, not making a statement on gay marriage and gay relationships, not making a statement on uh, financial issues, not making a statement on the president and politics, not making, I mean, I could just go through the list. They make, and we say this all the time, we're not here to make a bunch of statements. I love having conversations with people. The thing about conversations is they take time. It takes time to make a difference. Now, just one more way that I think we can make the most of every opportunity that comes our way and try to make a difference is this. We have to be careful that we don't focus on changing the behavior or beliefs of other people. Specifically, people who are not followers of Jesus. My light is going to shine brightest if I focus on myself and I focus on my issues and I focus on my character and I focus on my values and my morals and my ethics and on me and how I live. And the Apostle Paul was very clear about this. In one of his letters, he writes this, it isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders. It's not my responsibility to judge people who don't share the same faith I do. Our light shines the brightest when we worry about ourselves. Jesus, in one of the most popular teaching, t- teachings that he ever gave to his followers, says this. He says, you are the light of the world. Now, I don't want to be some Debbie Downer, but we all know this, that a lot of times we look at our world, and there is pain, and there is hurt, and there is confusion, and there is anger, and there is bitterness, and there are people at odds with one another, and there are wars happening, and there is evil unfolding in our world, and sometimes the only way to describe what we see is darkness. And Jesus said, let me be clear, you are called to be light in the midst of that darkness. He says, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. Now, we live in a very flat area here in Wisconsin, in northern Illinois. And so it's kind of hard for us to imagine a city on a hilltop. But just seriously, picture a city somewhere in our world on, on a mountaintop, on a hillside, that is in contrast to everything around it. And it's lit up at night. Jesus said, this is you. This is your life. And then he continues. He says, no one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. At which point, I'm certain people are writing down what Jesus is saying. They're like, this is good stuff, but I'm wondering how it applies to me right now. So Jesus does it. He flips what he's saying and he says, now let me give you some application. And what he says is something every single follower of Jesus needs to hear. And we need to hear it on a regular basis. He says, in the same way, in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father. Let your good deeds be obvious to everyone. Let your morals and your ethics and your values be a light in this world. Let the way that you do marriage, let the way that you parent your kids, let the way that you manage your money, let the way that you give your money, let that be a light in your world. Let the way you do business, let the way you interact with someone who's hurt you, let the way you foster, let the way you adopt, let the way you treat people with special needs, let that be a light. Let the way you love, let the way you don't judge others, let that be a light in this world. Live your life in such a way that when people look at you, they could say, man, it feels like there's darkness everywhere, but that seems to be a glimmer of light. And I don't think I even believe what they believe or agree with what they want to say, but man, there's something special about those amazing people. Again, this is why Paul writes, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Then he goes on and he says this, let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. In other words, every time that you have an opportunity to influence someone, every time that you have an opportunity to have a conversation with someone around this issue of faith, be wise in how you manage that conversation. Let it be full of grace, right? To be full of something means it's like on the brim, And if it just goes a little bit too much, it's going to start to spill over. He said, that needs to be your life. Let it be absolutely full of grace. 
To which our little pushback is, but, but what, if, what if someone's living in a way that doesn't honor the Lord? Like, you know how people are living. Just hold on, hold on. But, but, but shouldn't we talk about good and godly and wholesome lifestyle? Hold on, just hold on. But what about taking America back for God? Just hold on. Let your conversations be full of grace. The kind of grace that just spills out everywhere you go. Now let me just switch gears here as we start wrapping up and let me give you a little history lesson. Okay, so check this out. Jesus is gone. The apostle Paul has been killed. He was beheaded by Nero. The next 300 years, the followers of Jesus seem to get this right. Okay, you might remember this from history class. There were three major plagues in the first couple of centuries that just wreaked havoc on the Roman Empire. And in most cases, when a plague came into a city, people rightfully so, they took off. Right? They, got, they got out of town. But there were some people left behind. It usually it was the poor and the sick. In fact, the emperor, Marcus Aurelius, he wrote a letter in which he addressed the impact of these plagues. He talks about how at one point there's 5,000 people a day in Rome being killed because of them. And some historians say that was an exaggeration. So let's just say 500 people a day being killed because of the plague. In this diseased environment, it was the followers of Jesus who decided we want to be a light in the midst of darkness. So in many, many cases, the followers of Jesus stayed behind and they took care of the sick and they took care of the poor and they tried to nurture them back to health. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't work. But they made such a massive difference that by the time Constantine became emperor, this was about 300 years after Jesus was on earth, by the time he became emperor, a couple hundred thousand citizens in the Roman Empire were now following Jesus. But under Constantine, it just took off like wildfire. Well, about 50 years after Constantine, Emperor Julian came to power. And he actually opposed the Jesus movement. He was anti-Jesus. He wanted Rome to go back to persecuting and torturing the followers of Jesus. The problem was that Christianity had huge momentum because the followers of Jesus were known for their generosity and they were known for their compassion and they were known for their benevolence and love. We actually have a fragment of a letter that Emperor Julian wrote complaining about this because he wants to put an end to Christianity. I'm going to read you just a portion of his letter, and here he is. He's complaining about the fact that Jesus' movement cannot be stopped. Here's what he writes. He writes, he says, recent Christian growth is caused by their moral character, even if pretended, and by their benevolence towards strangers. Okay, this is so good. He says, the growth and the momentum we're seeing in the Christian community he says it's because they're so loving and they're so kind and they're taking people in and they're nurturing them and loving them and serving them. Even if pretended, he goes, because I honestly, I think it's all, 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 all fake. I don't understand how anybody could be that nice and that loving and that caring, but regardless, it's growing. He goes on to write this. He says, I think that when the poor happen to be neglected and overlooked, the impious Galileans, this was a term he used in reference to Christians, the impious Galileans observed this and devoted themselves to benevolence. The impious Galileans, the Christians, support not only their poor, but ours as well. So here he is, he's saying, I am fighting an uphill battle. Because they're not just nice to their the people who are part of their inside group. They're nice to everyone. They're loving to everyone. Who's going to want to walk away from that? Who's going to want to join whatever religion I think of? Who's going to want to be a part of what I'm a part of and start serving some other Roman or Greek God with these kind of people? He says, everyone can see that our people lack aid from us, but they're getting aid from these impious Galileans. You can spend your life trying to make a point or you can invest your life trying to make a difference. So Joshua Green set up his trust fund and his foundation. He just tried to be responsible with his resources. And he didn't know that many decades later, his granddaughter, her family, would use some of those resources and invest them in a church in southeast Wisconsin. That was kind of out of his hands. He just did what he was able to do. Whenever we choose to invest our time and our energy 
and our money into something bigger than ourselves, it's going to have a ripple effect and we don't have a clue of the amount of people who are going to be impacted because of it. This is why I've decided as long as I'm on this planet, I'm going to spend my life pouring into others and investing into things bigger than myself. It's my life mission. And it's why I'm going to constantly push you and challenge you if you're a part of this church to pour yourselves into things and into people other than yourself and into things way bigger than any one person. I don't know if you saw this, but this past week, our church once again made the front page of the local newspapers, Kenosha, Racine, great articles written about us, huge amount of likes on Facebook and social media, awesome. This fires me up. And the reason why is because Jesus says, let your good deeds shine out for all to see. And when we throw a prom for individuals in the special needs community, you know what's happening? There's a little ripple effect taking place. And thankfully, we're able to see some of that. Because most of the time when we invest into things, it takes years and years and years. It is a slow, slow process. Whenever we give our time and our energy and our money, whether it's pouring into children, whether it's investing into students, whether it's investing into different mission work and mission projects in our community or in our nation, right? We've started lots of churches, right? It's not, it's not something that just has this immediate payoff. It takes off in years. Now, I don't know if you know this, but because of our collective giving and because of our ongoing generosity over the past several years, we have been able to change the lifestyle of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people living in developing countries. We've done it with water projects. We've done it by uh, purchasing products uh, for individuals that change their life. Uh, just a simple example of this is we've uh, purchased biogas stoves for individuals and in, in, for families in, in, in two entire villages. Okay, so two entire villages of people have biogas stoves because of this church. Biogas stove is uh, powered by both human and animal excrement, so it sounds really, really gross, but the, the process is actually really sanitary, and it allows women in particular who would normally have to cook over fires to now have something other than that to, to cook over. On top of that, our collective generosity, we have uh, been able to give gifts of animals and livestock to 125 families in developing countries, which means they have a sustainable source of income. Because an animal isn't just, we kill the animal, it's done. It's a sustainable source of income. And so as we wrap up today, I want you to see how we're making a difference in the ripple effect that we're having in the lives of people we will never meet. Check this out. So the Apostle Paul says to these new believers, you can have a ripple effect, but you need to be wise in how you live. You need to build relational bridges. 
You need to guard yourself from making sure you just don't get caught up in ridiculous debates. You need to make sure you're focusing on the things that matter. And ultimately, he says, you need to make sure you're caring about yourself and how you live in your values. Let that be the light that shines in this world. Let's pray and let's ask for God's help in doing this. Our Heavenly Father, I pray for wisdom. Wisdom to know how to invest our lives so that we don't waste them or just spend them in ridiculous ways. Lord, give us wisdom on how to best invest our lives, making a ripple effect that lasts beyond our time here on this earth. And as you give us wisdom on how to best do that, give us the courage to do it. In Jesus' name, amen.